Well, good morning, folks. It is my pleasure to welcome you to St. David's Queenston United Church as we carry on with our online worship. Uh, this morning in the sanctuary, we have Alan and Lisa, and up top doing the technical support is Steve and Bill. And we thank uh, all for participating in this way. The day is coming as we plan that we will eventually be back together in the sanctuary, but we do remember that until that time, Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am in the midst. And so we remember that as we uh, look ahead. Some joys and concerns, well, mainly concerns. Um, there are prayers for Wayne, who is the son of Martha Fleming. He's recovering from a heart attack, a recent one, and so we keep him in our prayers. Barbara and Roger Redner, Kelly and Rob, as well, we name them before God in our prayer time. Marcia and Tim Terrell, Kathy, Leo, and Beth, we will include them as well. Uh, some two joys. One is a thank you to Judy Kerr for all of her help in the flowers over the summer. Um, flowers do brighten up things, and it's neat to know that someone out there is still thinking of in here, and as thinking of in here, you get to see it out there. Also, uh, Reverend Paul and Carol James have sent their thoughts and their love to the congregation, so we want to send that right back to them, uh, and we do miss them in our community. Each week we light a candle in our midst, reminding us that the flame that burns within that candle represents for us the presence and the light of Christ. I am the light of the world, Jesus said, and so we always want to have that reminder among us. And so we thank God for God's presence. Will you pray with me? Our gracious God, you invite us every moment of every day. But at this time and this particular place, we come to your presence and ask you to be with us. Lead us and guide us. Watch over us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first hymn is number 222, Come Let Us Sing. Pray with me. There's a quiet place where our hearts can grow far from the illusion. 
And in that quiet place, we meet you, O God, filling that place. And so we ask that of you this day. Bless our worship that it might truly be a love to your heart as you love us in Christ's name. We ask it. Amen. As I was thinking about children's time, as I said last week, we're all children. And some of us in front of our spouses probably seem more child than others. But I brought some few props with me today and wanted to ask you a question. Just down the highway from us is uh, Niagara Trailers. And I was out there uh, picking up my trailer after it had been had some work done on it. And I watched a person moving trailers all about the place and thought maybe we might have a bit of a lesson out of that. I'd also say if you think about the most important piece of equipment on a farm, what might you think it is? Well, in my box here, I put these gloves on because this thing's kind of dirty. I have the hitch of the ball. The trailer goes on the ball here and something needs to go through there in order to keep the trailer attached to my truck. And so I started to think, maybe ask a few questions about what is strengthening for us. If I was to put this zip tie through here, can you get it through there? There we go. And if I was to zip it up and then pull away, do you think it would be all right? Do you think the trailer would move? I don't think so. That's pretty flimsy, really. Well, another possibility. I've got some tape here. There we go. So if I was to put the hitch in and then wrap some tape around it. There. Think that? No. No, that's not going to do. Okay, something else. I know. A piece of doweling. A piece of doweling should do it. Just put that through. Yeah, maybe. That might work. But maybe I should test that. Just to see how strong it is. Nope, I don't think that's going to work. But there is one thing that's even stronger than that. And that is what we always called at home on our farm, the drop-in. It's always locked in place, and if I then take that and put it through there, and then lock the pin in place, what do you think? You think that'll work? I think it will. It's been working for a number of years, that little piece of steel. And I often wonder whether or not our Prayer life is like that. Last week we talked about the nature of prayer, and today we're going to talk about why it matters. And that that pin is very much like God's spirit in us, that when we welcome him into our lives, into our life as a community, and he is with us, it means that when the truck of God's love pulls out to take us over many bumps and smooth roads and sometimes different weather, but that pin will not let the trailer go. And we're the trailer. It'll never let us go. God's love is one that will never let us go. As long as that pin, often, is pra- of prayer is in place. And sometimes I've discovered that when I'm not in that place of, of praying, somehow God reminds me of that pin. So even when we forget the pin, God will remind us to put it in place. So think about that.
Our scripture reading this morning uh, comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, from chapter 6. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. Figs are not gathered from thorns, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of the heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure, evil, evil treasure produces evil, for it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Beautiful, Alan and Lisa, thanks so much for that. A good reminder. Will you pray with me? Our gracious God, you have given us your word as a lamp to our feet, a light for our path. So may we listen and gain the wisdom of your heart through that word as we share and walk together in faith. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, uh, last week we listened to about the nature of prayer and what it is anyway. And today we kind of continue a bit and talk about, hear about why does it matter? Like, why should I pray? Sometimes I wonder what good it will do. And more often than not, where do I begin? Sometimes in prayer, we spend a lot of time just thinking, thinking to myself about, say, the people I'm angry at, those that have annoyed me, people who are angry with me, and I know it. Things to know or things to do, things to plan, jobs, demands, family plans that all seem to get in the way of each other, things I see that need to happen if only God would just listen up, pay attention to me. I will accomplish this, or I will survive that. Will I win? Will I lose? Will I succeed? Will I fail? And along with a gazillion other things that grab my attention as they fly by in this time that is supposed to be what I would consider prayer. Taking time to talk with God can seem restless and a noisy place rather than a still and quiet place. But it's not all our fault, you know. We are conditioned in many ways. Parents and grandparents pass on to children the beliefs and values that they hold and they get carried on from generation to generation for the most part. We are conditioned in our world that everything needs to be productive or measurable unless you are just simply having a useless waste of time. We ask, what will this accomplish? What will this produce? Rather than, what might it mean for us or change in us in terms of our values and our live relationships? From what I do to what does it mean for me and what does it mean for others. A few years back we were sitting at the kitchen table and my wife Donna Dale and I were there with our uh, third child, Paula Jane, and there was a little pile of vitamins sitting right at my wife's uh, place setting. I'd put them out had to get them out, and I knew which one she took and how many, and half-jokingly, I said to her, I put them out for you, and you don't even seem to pay attention. So why, why should I do that? Why bother? And Paula Jane just kind of spoke up quietly and said, you should do it even when she doesn't pay attention. Somehow, you don't do it because it'll produce something for me but it would produce something for others. A few weeks ago, we did a thing with the candle. This is somewhat similar. Some would say this is simply a light bulb, but in a sense, I would beg to differ. There's no light in it, none whatsoever. I can blow on it, I can, well, I won't smash top it. It could make a mess. But interestingly, if I take this, glass and this metal and I place it in here better be careful I don't put it in the socket there we go now we have a light bulb the light is on it's now fulfilling its purpose in a sense our prayer life is much like that where we make connection with God. It's specific 
I have to be specific when I push this and turn it on or turn it off when I go now off to live my life for the day. Prayer has more to do with listening to God and what God brings into our lives. We can go through life being human, but never being fully alive. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you don't get bad fruit off healthy trees and you don't get good fruit off a diseased tree. The health of the fruit tells about the health of the tree. Who you are brims over into, the true, into true words and deeds for others. So what does determine who you are? What do you draw upon that makes you know that you're fully alive? One of the great saints, our saints said, the glory of God is people fully alive. The wholeness of our lives is determined by the contents of our hearts. And I don't know about you, but sometimes what's in my heart isn't so good. And it shows. Other times it is good. And it shows. It's in our posture of prayer that we cease doing in order to earn and start being and just simply listening to the one who gives us life and nurtures us in what it's about. I would suggest that God's love in prayer, that's what matters. It's that power that comes from without and becomes within. Alan Bloom, the great sociologist, uh, American sociologist, in his book, The Closing of the American Mind, he speaks of our inability to stop and we fill everything up every space. Our favorite phrase, thinking there's something noble about it, is, oh, I'm so busy. I'm just so busy. As though we should be adored by others for our busyness. We stop for nothing, maybe except for red lights. Today, the desire and drivenness to be useful in a goal-oriented society can be paralyzing, Henry Nouwen once said. It's based on evaluation. The, re the results of my effective busyness. Results become the high bar or the measure of my value and, I dare say, my value of others. Did you get that done? I needed that by 11 this morning. We become what the world says we are often, and that's how we get shaped. Not only in our families, immediate families, but the schoolyard, the educational system, and then out into the world, the working world, and we find that we're just struggling often to survive. We become what the world says we are, and we're intelligent because the teacher gave me an A. Or I'm helpful because somebody said thanks, and I get to start looking for the thanks as the reason to be helpful rather than being helpful for its own sake my young daughter pointed out to me quite vividly. We become likable because someone says hi or that they like us. Do you remember that in high school? Needing to be on the, in the crowd or being ostracized as one of the unlikables. We become important because somebody considers us indispensable. We become value, valuable because someone else says so. The danger is, though, that the bar keeps moving, and no one knows who's moving the bar. Every space is filled with external stimulation. Music, TV, video games. I was riding with my son one day, and he was listening to the radio, and I turned it off because I was wanting to talk with him. And he said to me, I can do both of those things. I don't think so. Morally and physically, we seem to always need to be on the move. And so some stories. Back in the early 80s, when I was in my first pastoral charge, I was riding home with a man who became a very good friend and I would say a mentor to me. And his name was Nort. And as we were driving back from a presbytery meeting that 
church of the, or court of the church that now no longer exists in our new restructuring, we were on our way back and I said to him, Nort, how is it that you came to follow Jesus? And he laughed in a sense, not at what the question, but with a sense of wonder. And he said, well, I was out in my barn during the, the fall harvest and I was holding grain in my hand. And as its nature, it was spilling through my fingers, but I was just looking at the crop. And all of a sudden, I was filled with a sense of awe. I looked around and I walked out into the field, one that had yet to be harvested right near the barn. And he said, all of a sudden, it just stopped me dead in my tracks. And he said, I dropped to my knees in realizing that none of this comes from me. Nothing of my drivenness to accomplish things could make me whole, Nort said. In the moment of opening myself up to actually see, I prayed and felt safe and was filled with the wonder of everything. He said, I found myself praying, not for something, but just because I was open to what it was that God had provided. Give us this day our daily bread, he said to me, took on a whole new meaning. Prayer in it, the Lord stopped me, he said, to take stock. The scripture reads, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, all creation declares the glory of God. Be still, cease striving, and know that I am God. Nord believed always, he was very involved in his church and a great supporter. He always believed there was a God. He said, now I open my life to God, to talk with God, and life absolutely changed. What I'd given lip service to now really mattered because it was underscored with nothing but awe and wonder. It stopped me. Prayer matters also because it releases me. I am the light of the world, Jesus said, as you are in me and you are that light to the world. I am the true vine and you are the branches. Detached from me, you will find yourself, yourselves pardon me, paralyzed. I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. So who is it that tells you and me about what life is truly about? Is it Coronation Street? Is it Netflix? Is it Prime, CNN, CTV, Fox News, Stephen King, John Grisham, Ken Follett? Who do we absorb and what do we absorb to tell us what life is about? I've told this story before, but I dare tell it again. In fact, I'll just bring it out. It's out of Henry Nouwen's book, The Road to Daybreak. And he, Henry was visiting during some retreat time with John Fraser, who was a European uh, correspondent for the Globe and Mail many years ago. And he told many stories about what he'd done in his life, who he'd covered, the Dalai Lama, wars, uh, all kinds of things, the Pope's visit to Holland. But among the stories, this is the one that Henry recounted that meant the most to him. And one morning when Jessie was four years old, she found a dead sparrow in front of the living room window. The little bird had killed itself because it had flown into the window and it lied, lay there lifeless. And Jessie was deeply disturbed, but also quite intrigued. She said to John, her father, where's the bird now? I said, I don't know. Why did it die? She asked again. And well, John said hesitantly, because all birds return to the earth. Oh, said Jesse, then we have to bury it. And so they found a box 
and wrapped a little um, shroud around the bird, placed it in the box, marched out into the backyard, and dug a hole and placed the bird in it. Jesse had even made a little homemade cross to place on the gravesite. And so her father said, we've now buried this little bird. And he asked Jesse, would you like to say a prayer? And Jesse said, with no uncertain terms, yes, I would. And she made her sister fold her hands. And Jesse prayed, dear God, we have buried this little sparrow. Now you be good to her, or I will kill you. As they walked away, John said to Jesse, you didn't have to threaten God. And she said this, I just wanted to be sure. In prayer, we come to God on God's terms, not our terms. And if there's one lesson that, Je that Henry Nouwen took away from Jesse's story was that we as people are full of compassion, but ready to kill when we're afraid. Personally, what's going on south of the border to our neighbor actually frightens me because we don't know where the tension that is building and continues to build is going to go as we, their northern neighbors, are only a string line away. In prayer, I come to God and find a solid foundation. But both of those stories, of one of control and one of release, God says to us, we have a different choice. Let me tell you what life is about. The solid foundation for what it will mean for me to live my life. It release, releases me to follow what I know to be true with the one who loves me and teaches me what life is about and leads me to that place of being fully alive. My daughter came up one day from, to the living room from downstairs in tears. She was about eight, her brother was 10. And she came in, I was reading, and she came in and said to me, Bryn called me an idiot. So I looked up, I thought, wow. It, and she said to me, he called me an idiot. So I said, Holly, I wasn't there. Like, go and work it out. There was no blood, so I wasn't really all that worried. And she said, but you don't understand. It's not fair that he should call me an idiot. And I said, yeah, that's probably true. And so she stomped out of the room, and as she left or went to go around the corner in the hallway, I said to her, so is it true? What, she said, that you're an idiot. She said, no. I said, well, then you listen to what you know is true, not what someone else says about you. And so she went downstairs. And I think that when we list, speak about prayer, it releases us to follow what we know to be true. Prayer stops us and allows us to take stock and learn of what is really valuable. And secondly, it releases me to act according to that rather than what having a posture that's ready to kill or to dominate when we're afraid. The third thing that prayer does is that it strengthens me. Jesus said, come to me all who, you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens and rest in your relationship with me. Take my load upon you and learn from me and you will find rest for your souls. A woman in my first pastoral charge, I'll just call her Sally, wrote me a letter after visiting her for many, many weeks, months. And she was in a hospital bed in her own home. And she was not going to leave that bed, likely. And it was interesting as I read this letter, and I would dare say awe-inspiring, that she taught me so much about prayer. 
And she said, my husband is close, but when it comes to survival, my oxygen tanks are closer. She had a good sense of humor. Only one is closer than that, and that is God. I lie here and pray for my son, who is in, was in Kingston Penitentiary for first-degree murder. And my daughter, who sacrifices her family and herself and God for alcohol. My own illness provides me with opportunity that protects me from elevating myself higher than them. It would be very easy to become judgmental. It's easy to become arrogant and my heart be one of judgment of them or anyone for that matter. I do not accept my suffering as well as I should and sometimes I feel robbed of compassion because of it. That bothers me until I remember I have opportunity here to pray. I always have opportunity to pray. Without this dastardly disease, I fear I would lose myself to the world rather than throwing myself on to God. From this bed, the world looks unimportant by comparison to what being in this bed has taught me. I hate the pain, the confinement, the isolation of being the one who's always sick. But I treasure what it has taught me about myself, my need for God, my need of you as a friend. What it has taught me about the illusion of wanting more, of eliminating the gift of suffering that alone helps me to see you and others with mercy and grace rather than arrogance and judgment. You know, Doug, she wrote, if there were no suffering in the world, we would never show each other compassion. It's taught me a lot about prayer, what prayer really is. Not something I do for God. It's not a duty. It's my way of learning greater confidence in the one who loves me. Without prayer, we stop spiritually breathing, she wrote. Without prayer, we're dead already. It's strange, you know. I feel stronger even while I know I am dying. The day, there comes a day when all of us will say and think and believe, and we will do it purely. But until that day, there are tests, as it will. Not that God is putting something on us, but life happens, and the reality is that none of us is getting out of this alive. Sometime I encourage you to go and find a dark place in the night, a clear night, where there isn't light pollution, if we can find it here in this densely populated area, and try and see the other side of the universe. Like, actually look and try and see it. Look past the moon. I dare say that the awe of the heavens will point you toward God. So why does prayer matter? Because it stops me in the midst. Be still and know that I am God. Cease striving and know that I am God. It releases me to grow. I am the vine, you are the branches. Detached from me, you can do nothing, and it strengthens me. Come, come to me, Jesus said, and I will give you rest for your souls. With prayer, well, that's why it matters. Will you pray with me? Help us, O oh God, to be a still axis in the wheel of activities that revolves around my life. Deliver me from my distractions, which are many, and lead me to the quiet place of devotion at your feet. Teach me there how to pause. I know I won't see everything, but help me to see something. So much passes me by, without attention, let alone appreciation, without reflection, 
let alone reverence, without thoughts, let alone thankfulness. Slow me down, Lord, so that I may see through the windows of your love, the overarching grandeur of your image in the chapel of my soul. Amen. Well, we come to a time in our service where we would normally receive the offering, but today we just have some words about the offering. Just as every business and every person's personal bank account needs to have it as full as possible because there are bills to pay, to keep going, and there's many resources that we have. And so I want to nudge a little reminder for all of us who are part of St. David's Queenston United Church to ensure that your tithe gets to us so that we can be here when we're all ready to come back. Amen. We now enter into a time of prayer. There's a quiet place where we can go, far away from the illusion and the confusion. And in this quiet place, you, O oh Lord, meet us there. And from your throne comes a fountain of love. And so help us to be quiet. to listen and to hear the voice of grace that buoys us up in an ocean of love. Lord, we are truly thankful for everyone who continues to contribute so that our life here as a congregation and a faith community can gather together in a different way but no less meaningful. We thank you for Judy and her help with the flowers over the summer. Thank you for staff here at the church who keep it clean. Those who work diligently on committees so that we will eventually, when the word is go, be gathered yet again as your body in this place. There are many. Thank you for the gift of music, which is the language of the soul. It moves us. It gifts us. And so thank you for the talents that provide such music. Thank you for Paul and Carol James sending a message of thoughts and prayers and love to us. No matter what, people, when they've been in this community, will always be part of its history and its memory. We pray for Wayne as he convalesces, as he recovers from a heart attack. For Barbara and Roger Redner, Kelly and Rob. For Marcia and Tim Terrell, Kathy, Leo and Beth. Lord, may you wrap them all with your love, even as a cocoon. And may every kind word and gentle touch be as your own heart to them. Remind them they are not alone. And you will never let them go. And Lord, we pray for our world. As it seems in many ways, what is often seen from distant lands, 
now seems to engulf much of our world of hungers for power at the cost of people's life and love and compassion. And so we pray you will interrupt and make your love known again through that great ocean of grace. Bless us, we pray, that we might bless you. We do ask it in Jesus, your Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray with one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 672, Take Time to Be Holy. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit bless us and keep us this day and always. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.